Okay, Thomas Fredberg, I come from Ericsson. Uh, I'm going to be here talking a little bit about data centers in other form factors as we go towards a more distributed edge and more computing further out in the network and what kind of problems that, that brings into it. Uh, we are a major large uh, telecom manufacturer, but we're also going in having uh, cloud equipment, going into OCP, uh, having working together with a lot of people on the floor here as well. So we're going to go into a little bit of the use cases on the market now and in the future, going into extending the data center as, as a unified system, uh, looking into networks and site types out there, the environment and the characteristics in those physical locations. And uh, we call a high temperature site building blocks, which is something we have in our portfolio today that, that we aim to contribute uh, into the OCP design as, as a framework. So if you look on the different use cases and go through these a little bit, I mean, if we start from the, the left top here, uh, edge computing, that's things that we normally would uh, come from sort of a 5G type of use cases or access near type of deployment, things you can have fixed access as well. Um, it could be many different sorts of, of venues that, that you uh, could have there, but today it's mostly about sort of the, the maybe radio processing or, or things that sits rather close to any customer premises equipment, but that will move out intelligence there as well over time mainly because the, the access time uh, will shrink, and when the access time shrink, there will come plenty of software people coming over the top application and sort of find good use cases for having a compute in very near proximity to the first radio hop, for instance, that is gonna go with 5G, gonna go down to millisecond level. Vertical applications, multiple different ones, uh, if you're on a cargo ship in the middle of the ocean, if you're up in the airplane, you have a lot of different local processing that you want to do. That's not your typical data center environment, I'll tell you. Internet of Things is going to require that you bring in a lot of transport into the data centers. They're going to be paying very, very different for different sorts of temperature sensor delivering a value in once a day or something like that. And those who want to do basically surgery uh, remotely. It's going to be very, very different. So there in, in telco world, we have something we call network slicing. And network slicing goes all the way in to whatever computing resource you have in the end as well. So to be able to schedule up the computing resource in the end of your network slice is going to be important. And that's not going to be only in the centralized place, because if you're, if you're bound by latency, then you need to have equipment further out as well, local distributed data centers. Uh, there are over uh, a number of virtual operators that would be basically be using existing infrastructure. Our, uh, our people normally talk about net neutrality when it comes to transport, so people can deploy systems virtually on top of somebody else's infrastructure. Public communication, fire, police, military, uh, those kind of things, um, as well as customer-centered network. It could be mines. Uh, sitting remotely up in the, uh, on, the, uh, on the earth, so to speak, whilst actually your excavator sits down in the mine in the dirty environment and you don't have to care so much about safety. Very, very difficult physical locations as well. So what I spoke about then is that central data center is most what this OCP summit is about when you go onto the shop floor here. But the further out you come, closer to an antenna site, the more you will need to care about your physical environment where you're going to deploy things. If you were here on the previous one, you, you heard the SK Telecom guy talk about that there is a vast difference between the hyperscalers of the world and the ones that has an existing, uh, both software as well as hardware, as well as physical buildings that they already have a lot of out there. Um, but it's important that we, we treat those as uh, we need to reduce the latency because the network will give reduced latency, that the further out you come, the more you need to share, and then you need to have more quality of service divisioning as well, and uh, that you can do real-time analytics on the level 
where it's important. Because if you do all the real-time analytics up in the high end, then you're sort of going to miss the events that happens locally that you can do control over as well. So a typical, this is a telco network that I took a picture from, but it could be any sort of a network. But typically, you would have your national data center somewhere in the world. You would go out through some sort of a regional type of network where you would have local breakouts, ingestion points of, of media, and so on and so forth. And then many, many more of the local uh, places where you would typically have the places where you consume things, radio antennas and so on and so forth, but also local ingestion points. It could be your local sports arena where you need to do media ingestions. Point of presence is normally called there as well. But it, it's a diversified world here in central data centers towards close to the radio heads in a physical environment. So what differentiates these one when it comes to characteristics then? I mean, in the data centers, what you talk about here, the hyperscales and so on, they tell you that scale is everything, that the IT type of cloud deployment is the ruling one, uh, that we can handle things by basically controlling the environment. And that makes sense if you have a lot of equipment because it's expensive in some way to, to control the, each and every equipment to handle the environment it's put in. Then it's easier to make an artificial environment that is very good for the equipment. So it makes sense on the central place. Um, as we heard the SK Telecom guy also saying, I mean, there is a lot of standardization that needs to go, but generally you would be on a seven foot type of a, a height, uh, maybe one to 1.2 meter depth, and a 30 degree C, uh, excuse me for being European, <laughs> but. Uh, um, when it comes to room temperature in here. And an AC power feed is very, very normal in this kind of environment. But if you go further out, you can see here a container being lifted into to place. And a container is a physical thing in this picture. It's not a mesosphere or something like that. And uh, you want to put them in harsh environments, in the middle of the desert, or in the middle of some sort of a very, very cold place, uh, sometimes antenna near very quickly. Um, you don't need to uh, go in and, and do a lot of cabling in those kind of places with, with operational staff when you deploy things. It needs to be put in place at the same time. But at the same time, uh, you might be very, very cramped for space. So in the sort of hot air blowing upwards, if you're, if you're getting into an existing room where there is people normally during the day, and you get sort of, OK, those 40 centimeters up towards the wall, that's yours. You're going to suck the air in the environment where people sit. Sometimes it gets hot, a hot day. Air condition might not work good enough. And you have 40, maybe 50 degrees C in this room sometimes. And you can't really take the, the air and blow it straight through the wall because you got your 40 centimeters. That, that's a very normal type of environment for what we in telco world talk about as central office environments. So shallow type of equipment, normal air, and blowing the air towards maybe a vent top in the top or something like that. DC power feed, very, very many of these existing installations do have a minus 48 volt battery pack. It's a very, very expensive installation. You don't throw out the battery easily and put in a 230 volt AC and put in UPSs and all these kind of things. It's expensive replacement because it's not one, two, or three. It's thousands, a lot of them. And then there are things like vibration uh, and other things in there as well, EMC, uh, noise, uh, and so on and so forth. So a number of the different characteristics in here. To be flexible in their placement, to be able to put them up to, against the wall, don't take too much space from the room, maybe back to back with each other, uh, having the ability for, for DC power cooling. Um, front cabling, that, that's a handling issue as well as when you have put something towards the wall. I've heard some people saying here, you really don't want to send in the guys to the hot aisle. If you put something against the wall, there is no hot tile. So I mean, you can't send anybody in there. So front access is key, but also the operational aspects of not having to put a cable in once you pulled something out. So as few cables as possible, but all the cables on the front. Um, redundant power, 
if you put these things out where there are new, no humans or where it's expensive to go there. I lived in Australia for a while. If you take the flying doctor's plane and put something in, in outskirts, I mean, you don't want to go there every day and, and, and change the equipment. You do that when you must. And then you want to have redundancy in, in, your, in your power supply. Low noise, if there are people in the room, you definitely going to make sure that uh, it doesn't disturb the people because it's a very, very hard environment if you go into a data center, as many people have pointed out here as well. Marvel, not the least, with their silent top of the rack multiplexer. Uh, redundant cooling as well. I mean, if the cooling goes away, you at least need to keep it maybe under 50 degrees C or something like that so the equipment doesn't blow. Uh, but you should be capable of living with, with a limited type of cooling. Power is a hard thing. I mean, if you're out in the bush somewhere, you might not get the power you wish. You might have power interruptions, short power interruptions. You might have power spikes, surges that comes from, from uh, the thunder out in the uh, existing out there as well. And then you would have the EMC protection that you don't want to radiate something. Uh, you don't want to take in radiation so you get disturbed by those things as well. Those are things that we live with normal day-to-day -day operation in the, in the telco world of historical uh, reasons, so we have a lot of good experience in that. But we see that coming again with distributed data centers, specifically when you're reusing environments or when you go into new industry verticals, such as we've seen a lot of interest from uh, factories that would like to put computing sort of it somewhere in the factory and to be able to do some sort of, of computation in that factory as well. They don't really go and buy a data center for that. They could, but, but some of them would like to use the existing space better. So what we do have from Ericsson that we use and ship and deploy today that we will then also contribute parts of today is a sub rack, uh, which is basically a smaller rack. I mean, it's not the full rack. It's, it's a part of a rack. You can put that in place and it's mainly a self-contained unit. It can be populated when you're installing it. You can have multiple sub racks sitting in a physical rack. Um, and it's very, very low on, on cabling because it has an electrical backplane. It's basically a blade server sub rack in there. Um, it has an ability to take the air from the front, take it in through the power and fan module you can see up on the right hand corner. There you would have filters because the environment in there could be rather dusty. For those of you who stand on the floor here, I think that you every morning go with a dust cloth and take off the dust, specifically if you have the, the black paint on the colors here. And uh, in those type of environments, these things must survive. So um, taking the air through a filter, blowing it through the compute boards, and then leading it up to a chimney. So you can have multiple sub racks on top of each other when you blow it up through the chimney. Uh, the front cabling you have to do normally in here, you take them in through the switches. Uh, it's very, very much OCP-like and, and rack scale design-like in terms of the management switches, IPMI and all these kind of things in there. Um, and you then have the data switching in there. And really what you have to do is you need to connect your data switching, the traffic coming in and out, and you need to connect your uh, management switch, and you're all done. So it's very, very few connections that you need to do. Everything else happens through the normal Ethernet switching on the backplane. And the built-in EMC protection here is a, a very important thing as well in, in terms of that they are self-sustained as, as a unit. They don't radiate out anything to the environment, and they don't, don't take in radiation. This takes some effort of getting there. Uh, and, and for the kind of environment that these are going to be put in, it will be important for some of them and for others not. Uh, <coughs> selection of components. When you go into looking at the switches and processor boards, for the selection of components, it's imperative that you look into that you take components that will lifetime uh, handle what your, what your expectations are. Generally, a data center here would live something like three, maybe up to five years, depending on what sort of equipment it is. Servers, generally three, switches more towards five. Uh, if you go to the environment here, 
it's a rather normal thing to expect seven years. Maybe you don't want to have that on servers if you're there servicing them often, refreshing them often, but maybe the switch gear needs to be that. If you have a remote location, you probably want to do a selection that, that makes you select a component that will last seven years in there as well. Uh, but they also need to be able to handle the heat. I mean, to be able to run at 50 degrees C ambient, that's, that's a rather hard environment for some of the components, especially if they need to live for seven years. So component selection is key to get a long lifetime and, and high temperature. But it's again, it's up to whoever would like to use it if they want to do that component <coughs> selection. It normally means that it's slightly higher price, it's slightly lower capacity, but you're getting a longer lifetime. So it is a selection that needs to be done when selecting components. Heat sinks, special care have to take to heat sinks so the, the airflow that comes through is going to good use uh, and that you're not clogging them if there comes in any dust or something like that. Uh, then the power uh, and fan module, that's the one that in, is taking basically ensuring that power spikes doesn't go through, that you have hold up capacitance uh, so they can feed the equipment with, with power even if there is a, a ditch dip in the, in the power. And the fans needs to be well regulated, rather large to be able to give you a low noise environment if you do have people in the room. Again, this is if you want to run them full steam ahead, those uh, fans, you can do that, but then they are not, not suitable to be with, together with people. Um, we're planning to submit the uh, sub-rack designs, so how they look like, mechanical formats and all, all these kind of things, sizes you can see up here, the ability for redundant switches in there, the uh, dual sync support, which in the telco world is pretty important. IT world, not so important. It's there. Uh, giving you rather high density for, for a particular sub rack as such. And uh, you can build completely redundant configurations here if you like. You don't have to, but I mean, that, that's a, a capability. Um, 48 volt, as I said, is the norm in here. If you want to go 230 AC with a, with a UPS or something like that, then you need to have an external power uh, distribution unit and converter there. And then three fans. So that, that would be the sub rack level contributed. On the board design, it's sort of a size of the, the boards for anybody to design their own boards in there as well. Uh, a list of, of component selection criterias uh, the connectors are pretty important here as well, if you want to be able to service things and how they fit in. The EMC shield mechanics sound simple, but it's not as simple as it looks. But, but those are in, in here in the contribution as well. And the heat sink and uh, the ability to be able to reach 50 degrees C on these ones. And I think that, that's more or less what we are contributing here. But then, if you looked on what I said in the beginning of the talk as well, it's that we're moving out even further out into the network, even towards uh, the antenna sites and so on and so forth. So I think that we ought to, to spark a discussion here in, in OCP as well, if there is room for even one more of some sort of a building practice being even more ruggedized. I don't know the outcome of that discussion, but I mean, if you're sitting more or less on the antenna post or something like that, maybe you want to have something that is completely shielded, something that maybe looks like a radio gear, where dust from the environment, where rain and so on and so forth doesn't really get into the electronics. Rain is good because it's cooling you better, instead of saying, okay, you get the humidity problem inside instead. But I think that's a discussion we need to start because 5G is coming rather soon. Uh, and when 5G comes, we're going to expect that we have the distributed computing power for the different types of uh, distributed computing that the over-the-top guys would like to place very antenna near. So it, it's sort of a rally-up of interest to everybody in here to start thinking about how would that look like, start communicating so that when we come back a couple of years from now, having set, set that sort of a standard, that it's not going to be too wild, but it's going to be interoperable to some level. Because I think that 
as a community, I think we need to in some way shape up. I'm, I'm hearing that all over the place that you have, we have done a great job getting here with the openness, haven't done so great of a job of being interoperable in some of the aspects. But the interoperability takes time, it takes a number of trials, and it takes a lot of discussions and reaching that consensus that the SK Telecom guy talked about here before as well. So it's rallying up interest for what is the next form factor after something like, I mean, what we have here is something that some other telecom vendors also would have in their arsenal, uh, but what is the next step after that? And with that, I'm opening up for questions, comments. So is, is this a new design, or have you had one already in your arsenal, you're just kind of saying this is what we already <laughs> use for telcos, data centers we're submitting? Good question. Um, the question was if this is a new design from us or if it is an existing one. Uh, the boards you saw on the pages here, it's the eighth generation of our boards. We do have this well-proven, battle-proven out in the field, have been delivered for a long time. We call it NEBS 3 compliant fully. Uh, we have certified the system for that as well. So it is an existing design that we're opening up for, for others to design towards. Other questions? Yep. Um, if you would look at an ATCA PowerPoint slide on a logical level, and this what we call a BSP8100, you would not be able to tell the difference. Uh, if you would look on it from a physical point of view, you would see that ATCA have a rear transmission module, so it needs rear access. You can get away without using that, uh, but ATCA generally has so much flexibility so that if you don't cut down that flexibility, you're not going to get a plug and play. So if you think ATCA, smaller form factors on everything and taking away the rear transmission uh, IO modularity. I think the question was, how do we deal with high temperature when it comes to SSDs and fabric modules? Yeah. Um, great question. Uh, basically, it is that very, very thorough thermal design, very good heat sinks in there, and a selection of components. Those are the three key things. Sometimes you need to select components from the supplier's list, which is specced in, in a a little bit lower frequencies, but a longer lifetime. And some of the different components will be binned in that way. Some of them will actually do special versions of it. Some of them will just be that they say that, okay, if you run it at uh, lower frequencies, then it will consume less uh, TDP. And less TDP means that you need to cool it less. And if you then power cap it at that level, then you can survive it. But it is a system choice. Do you think there's a path to take, like, say, that we talked about earlier, this group to open racks, the CG open rack, to see that get to 50C? Or do you think you really have to just give up on that and go to the, the module and miniature sled approach? I think if that computer group would, would like it to go there, there is a path. But I think it's really about what is, what is the ask from the market. If the market would ask for it, they will go there. Uh, if the ask from the market is not yet there, then there will not be enough manufacturer putting themselves behind that one. So I think it's all down to business case in there. Okay. okay, and I thank you very much for the attention.